Thank you, Mrs. Helge, for that incredible music. The music was absolutely sublime with a message that hopefully, hopefully all of us walk away with. Greetings. Hello. Very nice to be here. A joy to present a thought or two here at the Feast of Tabernacles. There is a word that we use to identify major characteristics of an event or a person or a thing. It's called a hallmark. The hallmark of this, the hallmark of that. It's an identifier. Webster defines hallmark as a noun. An official mark stamped on gold or silver articles in England, go back, back a few years, to attest its purity. Purity. It is also a mark or device placed on or stamped on an article of trade to indicate origin, purity, or genuineness. It also is used as a distinguishing characteristic, trait, or feature of an event, person, or thing. If I were to say we have the hallmark of Mr. Webster, Mr. Webster's, sorry, Mr. Weber's ministry, it is a passion for truth and enthusiasm and joy for life. That would be his hallmark. Hallmark for the body of Christ, the church of God, Christ followers, is that we brothers and sisters have love one for another. We are identified. John 13 says that when people see you having love for another, you will be identified as a Christ follower, as a Christian. It's visible because that's who we've become. That's the hallmark. And we may well ask, what is the hallmark of our own families? When people say, well, what about the Crow family? What about the so-and-so family? What is their hallmark? Because all of us have identifying features. What about the Feast of Tabernacles? The Feast of Tabernacles these days that we observe also has a hallmark, a visible identifier that is noticed by the world around us. I've had a number of conversations already with those who see us in action in this room. Mr. Moody called it the kingdom effect. And one of those three points that he gave is one of the points I'm going to explore today. As a lead, and I have to explain, maybe open up myself a little bit, my childhood for me was normal, but it wasn't normal maybe to you. My normal life was filled with tension. I never knew if or when I would overstep myself and find myself at the hard end of discipline from my parents. My environment was fraught with anger, criticism, and competition. Criticism and competition and anger, especially anger. I learned growing up to be angry. It took years and years, and I'm still working on it because it's, it was so embedded. Flinching at, at home was a sad way of life because you just didn't know. There was no peace in my house. It was, a, it was the life that I learned. Mr. McKe McKeon talked about heat and friction. Well, whenever you woke up, there was heat and friction, and there wasn't always the oil to smooth things over. At age 14, enter God's mercy, enter God's love, the illumination of his plan. I'm now uh, in my mid-teens, and it became life-changing. God opened my mind. Not my parents, my mind. And I tried to understand what God was teaching me. It was the mid-60s. Yes, I'm that old. Central Florida. We didn't have a physical church to go to, so we were struggling and learning at home. We didn't have examples from the church members of how God's way works. We were on our own. So there was some change. There was some growth, but it wasn't hard and fast. Then, 1969, 50 years ago, this is my 50th feast. I ran into the hallmark of the millennium, the hallmark of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jekyll Island, 1969. I was told when you, you got this giant uh, tent, pretty much held all of Jacksonville, just seemed like, and the rain was pouring down, they said, well, if you hear a pop, don't look up, because the rain was hitting the light bulbs and it would pop. Of course, as soon as it popped, I did look up. I do what I'm told now today. 
But it was then that I experienced the hallmark of the feast, the hallmark of the millennium, the hallmark of the coming kingdom of God. And it's in one word, and you're going to hear me say this over and over today. It's peace. I experienced peace for the first time. Peace of mind, peace of heart, and it was life-changing for me. It was life-changing. Every minister, it's been said, every minister has one sermon and he gives it in a variety of ways. Over the years, I have learned that the peace of God overwhelms me. It drives me. That is my centerpiece. That is my theme, the, the kingdom of peace, the God of peace, the gospel of peace. And it t it's taken me years to get rid of the hard part, growing up with anger and frustration and, and being critical. I'm not done. Don't push button. I'm not done, but I'm growing. I had been taught a way of anger and criticism and conflict, and at that first Feast of Tabernacles, I learned and started experiencing true peace because the brotherhood, the brethren, brothers and sisters, were showing true peace to one another. It was the first time I had seen that, 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 that experience. People were helping one another. People were getting along. People were sharing with one another. They were uplifting each other. They were encouraging one another. There were no put-downs. There was no criticism. There was no dismissal, no competition, no one-upsmanship. People were being Christian. They were promoting and demonstrating peace and how refreshing it was and how revealing it was and how life-changing it was. Peace is coming to this world. It's not here yet in the way that we know that it's coming, but those who are coming out of the great tribulation will need individuals who can lead them to peace. They have just gone through a great tumultuous event in a world that does not know peace, does not know how to get peace, does not know how to achieve peace. And it's going to need individuals who have been prepared to teach a way of life that is peace. The world we see does not know peace. Pick a side. Left, right, Democrat, Republican. No one knows the way to peace. Whether it's presidents, prime ministers, emperors, kings, queens, a democracy, a republic, or even a dictatorship, no one knows the way to peace. They do know one way, though. My way or no way. I heard that numerous times in, in, uh, in the business world. My way or no way. Historian philosopher Will and Ariel Durant, in talking about histories over time, said, as of 1968, during the past 3,421 years, the world experienced only 268 years without war. That's declared war. Since World War II, we've had 200 declared wars. The question is, what does man know? What does man know? Let's go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. The foundation of society is, is based on this scripture, Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, starting in verse 4, No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak, li speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. Verse 7, Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made for themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. This world is on crooked paths. They think they know the way to peace, and they can't get there. We must understand peace is not just the absence of war. 268 years, there was an absence of declared war, but was there any peace? There was, there was no peace because the world is still filled with anger, hurt, pain, conflict, animosity, hatred, hostility, and bitterness. 
And with that kind of environment, there is no peace. You cannot have peace. My home life as a child may not have been at war, but we weren't at peace. It wasn't until I began attending the church and then seeing the Feast of Tabernacles in action, day after day, seven days at the feast and the last great day, the eighth day, seeing peace working among the brethren that I began to understand and see the peace that God has. Anger, hurt, pain, conflict, being critical, animosity, hatred, hostility, these are not part of the kingdom of God. These attributes prevent one from rejoicing before God. You're here rejoicing, and when you say you rejoice, it's because these attributes are gone. They're not there. So what are you and I to do? What about us now and in the future, in the millennium? We have a personal assignment. Let's go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. We do have a personal assignment. I remember this scripture the very first year in Jekyll Island. Fifty years later, I'm understanding it better. We don't get it all at once, do we? We don't get it all at once. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. Crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. What an assignment. We are part of the assignment to prepare the way. Well, how do we do that? The word prepare in Hebrew is pana. There'll be a test. And it means to turn around, to turn and look, to turn toward. What are they to turn? What are we to turn to? We are to turn toward the preaching of the gospel. And as mentioned elsewhere in, in God's word, it is the gospel of peace, Ephesians 6. It is the gospel of peace. We teach about the gospel of the coming kingdom. It is the good news of the coming kingdom of God. It is the gospel of peace. That is the hallmark of what we're celebrating, of what we're rejoicing. It is peace. We are then to make straight, to make right, to smooth out. To lead and direct, if you go into, into some of the definitions there, to lead and direct to a highway for our God. To make straight what has been crooked. This world has crooked paths to peace. And we are to share, to show, to be examples of the way of peace. We are part of the process leading this world to peace. And it starts with us. It starts here in this room. It starts there at your home. It starts where you go to school. It starts in your employment. I'll get to that in another, another moment or so. Peace of mind and peace of heart and the physical peace is a hallmark of the millennium of the kingdom of God. It is a hallmark of being a Christian. Jesus Christ has a title, you know it, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace, John 14, that's what he's called. We serve a God of peace. We are to preach the gospel of peace. And how important is it to have godly peace in our lives and the lives of those who, to teach it for those who are coming in a thousand years to come? How important can it be? Let's take a journey. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. You know, it's, it's a simple word. Five letters. P-E-A-C-E. Five letters. <laughs> and I'll use that word probably more than a hundred times in this message. It really is a theme for me. It really was life-changing. It made a difference in my life. It made a difference in the life of my family, how I dealt, dealt with individuals in, the, in this world. Peace. Hebrews 12, verse 13. Well, 12. 
Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. I mean, there's, there's a humility and, and a, a carefulness in dealing with one another. And make straight paths for your feet. You see, we grew up in, I grew up in, all of us, times past before God in his mercy called us, we were all on crooked paths, all wanting to have peace. But we were on that crooked path that does not lead to peace. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see God. No one will see God without peace. When God created man and woman, he put them in the Garden of Eden and they were at peace. Enter the snake, enter that demented being, and he introduced anger, frustration, doubt, and he destroyed the peace that they had. And we've been on that crooked path since. We've been on that crooked path since. It is so important to focus on the peace of God because if we don't have it in our lives, if it's not part of us, if it's not an overriding attitude, we could miss God's kingdom. Without peace, one, does not, one cannot see God. It is that important. If we are not at peace, if we're not teaching peace, if we're not focusing on peace, we could miss out. The hallmark of this feast, the hallmark of the millennium is that important. Peace. Well, how do we do that? How do we remain focused on peace in a world that is self-destructive? How do we help others to focus on peace? Oh, I just happen to have an answer. Isaiah 26, one of my favorite scriptures. It's hard to have just one favorite scripture because they all impact us on various ways. But I came across this years ago, and I, I find that it, in a world that is topsy-turvy, in a world that just thrives on conflict and issues, that I can have peace. People at work wondered why, when things went, were going wrong, why is Fred comfortable? Why is he okay? The answer is in Isaiah 26. Excuse me. Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Kind of a little standalone scripture there. You will keep him in perfect peace. When you look up the Hebrew, that is shalom, shalom, back to back, two words, the same. And it means perfect peace. How can we be at peace when we go through major trials? How can we be at peace when our family is going through trials? How can we be at peace when the world around us is going to uh, self-destruction? It's because our mind is on God. And we trust God. The more we spend time with God, the more we see his hand in our lives, we trust him. We may not see the answer at the time. I can't begin to tell you all the stories. There are some out here who know those stories where I don't know the answer, but I know God and that God would answer. Perfect peace. He will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Well, how do we keep our mind on God? For those who are dealing with my notes, I'm going to take a flyer here. Join me in, in Philippians 4. Philippians 4. When we start with difficulties, when we see trials, when we go through troubles, how do we keep our mind on God so that we could have that perfect peace? Paul, talking to Philippians, gives us that answer. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, when those who are coming into the millennium are struggling, we will help them to understand what is true. Because the world has been filled with lies. Revelation 12, 1 John 5. You have the father of lies who deceives the world and then he holds sway. He grabs your emotions and, and sends you on the wrong way. 
they need to be taught. So we'll teach them whatever is true, whatever things are noble. I love the ocean. I walk the ocean. I, I could live in the ocean if I could. Because to me, God's glory is, is bound up in this magnificent uh, water. And you see the power and the energy in the water. And to me, that glorifies God. What it, I'm nob- ennobled when I'm at the ocean. I'm also fascinated because when he talked to Job, he said, the ocean only this far and no farther. And I'm walking the edge of the ocean, and I'm always reminded by that. It can only come to my feet, can't overwhelm me, because God said, only that far. And then, of course, you have to understand the tides, otherwise you're ending up swimming. Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate, think on, mull, put these in your mind. And with God as a foundation, then perfect peace have they whose mind is stayed on God. And then you gather all your experiences and you learn to trust God. Even when you don't see the answer in front of you, you learn to trust God. Perfect peace. I I love that phrase because it's shalom, shalom. And then we we learn to trust God for whatever happens whatever happens. Let's meander further into James. You know, James said that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. And this is what he adds. James 3. James 3. We need to be reminded occasionally that the Mind of God is so much higher than ours. His thoughts are so much higher than ours that if we are still thinking on a worldly level, we, ha- we can miss the mark and we can still be walking a crooked path. James 3, verse 17, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. It is pure. There's nothing wrong with it. It will always be right. It will be for our benefit. We may doubt, we may have questions, we may struggle with understanding, but it is pure. It is first pure. Notice what it is also. Then peaceable. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Wow. The fruits of righteousness are sown in peace. We want to be righteous before God. God has given us his spirit. We're a different person now. We're a different creature, a new creation. And then we are to teach those who will be following us to teach them peace. To teach them peace. Now there's an an exciting thought that I want to address when we start putting the pieces together, there's a clarity in God's word and it becomes visible and exciting. I want to add another uh, focus here. Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32. Isaiah 32. For 42 years, I, I was in business. Not my own business. I worked for someone else. But there was always a product. There was always effort. Work, and then there was output. There was always something that we created, something that we sold so that we can continue to build and sell, build and sell. There was always something that we were producing. Isaiah 32, verse 16. Talking about the time that is yet to come. Then justice will dwell in in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace. You know, God wants us to be righteous. We're called to be a different person. And righteousness is a hallmark of God. And if we try to and work using God's spirit to be righteous, the output, the product will be peace. Peace in our life. Peace with all those around us. That's kind of cool. 
It cause and effect, cause and effect. The effect of righteousness is peace. Let's continue reading here. Where was I? Yeah. Uh, peace. And the effect, the effect of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Those who are coming out of the great tribulation need encouragement and comfort and peace. And we are here to learn to demonstrate peace, to teach peace, to be part of that process. Those who would enter into God's kingdom, those who would enter into the, God's realm must be about peace, must be focused on peace, must be a peace bringer, must be willing, wanting, and able to show the way to peace. How have you been doing so far? We're five days into the feast. I'm sure there's been inconveniences, surprises, difficulties. How'd you handle them? I hope I have time. Uh, on on uh, atonement, my wife and I were heading to Eureka. We were driving up the coast. And we found out about the power outage by PG&E. Thank you very much. It was interesting. And I made phone calls while we were driving to see if we were still going to hold services. So we still kept going north because we didn't know if I, I had to cancel services. But our van decided to cancel services. First, a little red light that said batteries got problem. It came on. I'm not a mechanic. To me, mechanical things are incantations and senses. That, it's magical stuff. I kid. And I kept driving. I called the dealer. I said, we're heading toward you. You're, you're halfway up uh, to Eureka, so we're going to stop in Ukiah. And uh, we're going to need your service. And he said, okay. Now, we had planned pre-atonement uh, dinner at 1.30. So the van had other ideas, and it, when I talked to the dealer, he said, is it doing anything else? That was, that was a precursor to some difficulties I was unaware of. And I said, no, and he said, okay. So we kept driving, and then it just said, I'm done. We pulled over to the side of the road, and we were on the side of the road for two and a half hours waiting for a tow. Um, there was a number of absolute miracles that took place. My wife and I were not upset. It, it was just a fact of life. We then had to cancel Eureka services because they, the hall was without power. We needed to get a ride to the dealer. The, he had one seat. There were two of us, one who needed uh, wheels. Police officer comes up and says, oh, I'll, I'll take your wife. Just happened to show up and said, yeah, I'll give her a ride. And uh, too much of the story. The whole thing was, it didn't bother us. We were at peace. We, we deal with what's in front of us. Our example to the tow, drive, the tow, truck, diver, the tow truck driver, the police officer, the people at the dealership, the people at the hotel we had to stay at, was that we were at peace with what took place. It was what it was. And in fact, it turned out that what needed to be fixed before we came on this journey needed to be fixed while it could be fixed because had we come down when we planned, we would have been stuck on the road. We would not have gotten here until Tuesday-ish, maybe. So it broke in the right time, just the right time. I just love those things. It, it broke in the right time. Getting back to my thought here, as the church, as the body of Christ, we represent, we represent, people see us as a, represent, a representative of Jesus Christ and of God. And that, that representation is of the pr Prince of Peace, Isaiah uh, 9, the King of pe Peace, Hebrews 7. We represent the kingdom of God on earth today. When people see us, we live by the laws of the kingdom of God today. We show people what to do for tomorrow. Peace is the outcome of the works of righteousness. Peace will be the hallmark and identifying sign of those who are called by God. That is what Jesus Christ is about. He is about peace. Well, today we know that the world doesn't know peace. Everyone believes they know the way, whether it's Democrats, 
Republicans, liberals, conservatives, socialists, they all say, pick my side, pick my side. And this brings me to my, my favorite thought, the three-sided coin. And you're going, what? You flip a coin, it's one side, up. no, it's a three-sided coin. There's side A, side B, and then there's the edge. Flip a coin, Democrat, Republican, hope it lands on the edge because that tiny edge represents God's way. There's one way, one way, and God's way. And how often when I had conflict in myself, it's because I was choosing an A or B. There's only one, one or the other. No, there's always God's way. God's way must start. That's where we start. There's always the edge. Man has tried and failed to engage peace. We go back to the League of Nations after World War I, the United Nations after World War II. We've had coalitions and unions and partnerships, and they've all failed. Man looks to power, position, and prestige for peace. We look to the Lamb of God. And yet, to bring about peace, there needs to be power. There has to be power. Thankfully, the world tomorrow will, will be guided by that power, the Prince of Peace, the one true peacemaker, the one holding all the power of the universe, bringing that peace that has escaped this world. That one peacemaker is Jesus the Christ. We're celebrating and rejoicing the, the return of Jesus Christ here today. This is the shadow of things to come. What we are learning here at the feast is that Jesus Christ will return and bring with him his peace. His peace, a real peace, a true peace, an everlasting peace. Because he's called the Prince of Peace. Question, is there peace right now on this earth? Think about it. Is there peace right now on this earth? Yes. Yes, there is. The peace that escapes the world is right here in you, in me, and it was given to us by Jesus Christ. Let's go to John 14. John 14. Jesus Christ is talking to his disciples. There is a, there is a trial that they're going through. They're, they're in confusion. They're, they're frustrated. They see the danger that's coming on for their master. John 14, verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you, bring to your remembrance all things that I have said. I think that's great because my memory is kind of porous. I have a camera, no film type thing. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives peace. The world gives you a crooked path. Will not take you to peace. Will not bring you to peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world does, uh, gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Wow. This is the peace of God. And what is that peace? It is an understanding of the plan that he has for mankind. It is an understanding that all we see is not all that there is. We understand that there is a coming time when there's, God's going to wipe away every tear. There's not going to be any more pain. We will be at true peace. Even as we go through trials and difficulties today, we will be given true peace. And he give, gave that to us through his Holy Spirit. Yes, there is peace on this planet today. And it's in this room. And it's in many rooms around this world of those who are attending the Feast of Tabernacles. And those who are home because they are unable to attend, but they have God's Spirit within them. And they demonstrate peace. They de demonstrate an attitude of being a Christ follower, a Christian. The peace that God has given to us, the longer I'm part of this journey, is astounding. Philippians 4. Go back to Philippians. Philippians 4. Verse 
Philippians 4, verse 4. We're here to rejoice before God. We're here to celebrate the shadow of things to come, an extraordinary event that is yet to happen, and we're here to rejoice. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I, say, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace that God has given to us can be awesome, surpassing understanding. I didn't know 50 years ago the full extent of peace. 50 years into this journey, I still don't know the full extent of peace because I'm still on the journey. There's a peace of mind. There's a peace in our heart. There's peace in our lives. And by demonstrating peace and having an attitude of peace, we grow in grace and knowledge. We're given the peace that God, that surpasses all human understanding, and it guards our hearts and minds. It is a guard. It is a, a prevention against a satanic attack, small s, that it, we can push back against Satan. He brought turmoil to Adam and Eve. They just needed to keep their mind on God. Today, by keeping our mind on God, we can have perfect peace in a world that has no peace at all. Everything we're learning at the feast tells us that we are called now today to represent Jesus Christ, to represent the kingdom of God on earth, to represent the peace of tomorrow today. From the point of God working with us, everything we say and everything we do must now reflect that of a peace bringer. And that can be hard. That can be hard. When people see our example, they should see a way of peace. When children see our example in our homes, they should see the way of peace. When coworkers see us at work, they should see a way of peace. Those who are coming out of the tribulation, those who are going into the millennium, need to see a way of peace. I learn by, by example. I uh, forget who mentioned how, how people learn. I can read. I think I can read. And see instructions. But someone needs to show me and guide my hands so that it, it works for me. I, I learn by doing. I, I can't learn really learn by just reading. Some of you are brilliant that way. I'm not. I've, I've got, I won't go there. It doesn't work for me. I'll just, say, I'll just say that. People should see the way of peace in us. We show the peace of God in us in everything we say and do. God's way works. God's way works. It, it's, we, we picked that up, that phrase from youth camps about 30 years ago. I, I forget when. But God's way works. And we take our kids to, to youth camp and we show them his way works on a physical level and we're showing a spiritual essence to physical kids that God's way works. And then we take it to work and we take it to our homes and we take it to the world around us. God's way works. And it is the work of peace. And when we try and work with God's spirit to be righteous, the output the product, what we are producing is peace in our lives and the lives of those around us. How important is that? How important is that? Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Probably know this one. Part of the Beatitudes. Part of the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, the son, called sons of God. It actually does mean children of God. Are we peacemakers? Do we reach into the lives of ourselves and those around us and try and generate and create peace? Are we an example of peace? Are our words peaceful? Are we patient a patient peacemaker within our family. Peace should be a hallmark of all our families. Peace should be resident in our residence. 
It should be an identifying mark. It should be at home, at work, or wherever we are. Let's take a note, uh, just a quick note of a couple of things. 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to throw a few quick scriptures at you. 1 Corinthians 14. First Corinthians 14, verse 33. Okay, verse, yeah, verse 43. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. One of the joys I've had over the years is, is doing a little traveling and visiting churches. My wife and I had the joy of visiting a number of churches and just taking off and going visiting, and guess what? The same peace that was in our home congregation was in the churches we visited because God's Spirit agrees with God's Spirit. Wherever we went, there was peace, and there was joy, and there was camaraderie, and there was fellowship, and there was love, and there was caring because that's the hallmark of the church. That's the hallmark of the church. God is the author, the creator of peace. That's what he wants in his kingdom. He doesn't want conflict. He doesn't want disagreement. He had that. He had the most perfect being, Lucifer, who allowed pride to destroy him. And he won't allow that in his kingdom again. The kingdom is all about peace, the peace of God. And we preach and teach the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6, I kind of touched on this earlier, but Ephesians 6, one of the in-home Bible studies we have going right now is we're going through the armor of God. Mr. Hill is, is covering that in Santa Cruz. But I want to mention this. Part of the armor of God includes the binding on our feet of the preparation of the, of the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand, the evil, withstand in the evil day and have done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and peace is the output, the product of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This helps protect us against Satan, small s. To focus on the gospel of peace. And I like that it's, it's pointing down, down to the feet because when we walk on straight paths, we are at peace. It's when we take a crooked path that we don't know the way to peace. And then we are to teach the gospel of peace, the good news, the message that Jesus Christ brought. That there is a coming peace. We still have to do something. We still have to to put out effort, Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, getting close to conclusion here, Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verse 14, I was just there. Well, how about that? Okay, different emphasis though. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Pursue peace. That takes effort. That takes thought. That takes knowledge. That takes study. That takes determination. That takes choice. I grew up in a world that was tense and filled with anger. And I had to study and I had to work and I had to struggle to get that out of my system. And it's toxic. Anger is toxic, and it loves to stay in your mind. Every now and then, it comes back. But it took effort, thought, knowledge, determination, and a choice and a desire to get away from that life and to pursue peace. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see God. It was that important. If it was easy, we wouldn't have that instruction. It's, it, it is that we have to pursue it. 
We have to follow it. We have to engage it. We're reaching toward the end of the, this year's festival experience, and the question we could ask ourselves is, how have we been doing as an example of peace? Are we patient with one another? Are we patient with inconvenience and disappointment? I won't tell you about the story of one time I, we had a, a hotel in Sacramento, and they kept saying, yeah, come on, come on, come on. When we got there, you know how the room's not made up? The room wasn't built. <laughs> so you, you just deal. You just deal with it. Are we being a peacemaker, whether dealing with one another, with our spouse, with our children, with traffic, restaurants, hotels, personnel? Are we patient? Are we long-suffering? Think of that word. We suffer long. That's what it means to be long-suffering, to endure for the sake of others. Are we encouraging, uplifting, or are we doing put-downs and criticisms and dismissals and competition? Jesus Christ followers Christians engage in promoting and demonstrating peace. All too soon we're going to go home. One point I just I kind of overemphasized it is there needs to be peace in our lives so that we can teach peace to those who are yet, who are yet coming, who are coming behind us. We have been given the peace of Christ in order to show the world the way to peace. In all that we say, in all that we do, in all that we think, in all that we are. And by doing so, we glorify God in the great calling that he's given to us. A couple of more scriptures. Philippians 1. Philippians 1. Philippians 1, verse 27. Or back up a little. No, I'll just stay with 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And the gospel we know is the gospel of peace. The gospel of Christ is the gospel, gospel of peace. The peace that is yet to come. The peace that we represent. The peace that is now in our lives. The peace that Christ has given to us. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that when I come and see you or I'm absent, whether I'm here or not, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Our conversations, our words, our actions, our deeds are worthy of the gospel, the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of peace. When we're challenged, we don't challenge back. I like the phrase that we assume positive intent. That we just assume when we have an interaction that may seem a little difficult, we assume positive intent. What have we covered? God is the author of peace. God is the God of peace. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. The works of righteousness produce the output. The result of righteousness is peace and that we are to teach and preach the gospel of peace. Closing scripture, Romans 12. Romans 12. Acts Romans. Romans 12. I like this scripture because it really points the finger at me as a follow-through. Romans 12, verse 9. Well, verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Cling, hold on to, grasp. It's a lifeline. Be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. We're here to rejoice before God with the hope of what is coming. Patient in tribulation, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. 
Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, and I'm pointing the finger at me, live peaceably with all men. If it is possible, and it is, and it, as much as depends on you, and it does, live peaceably with all men. It is always within our own power to demonstrate the peace of God. We are to show to all those around us the peace of God that is coming, that this world so desperately needs and begs for and yearns for and doesn't know how to, to get there. You have the peace of God in you. This is the message that God has given to us during these days, this, this millennial time that is represented by the time we're here. And it shows a hope of tomorrow. And we show that hope in our families. We show that hope in our employment. We show that hope in our schools. We show that hope wherever we go. Throughout the next year, blessed are the peacemakers. Keep that in mind. Representing the hallmark of the coming kingdom of God. For they shall be called the children of God. What an awesome assignment. Have a peaceful rest of the feast.